Once again I face Satan this morning And I battled him all the day long But in my weakness God sent reinforcements And at sundown I sang victory song And the sun's coming up in the morning Every tear will be gone from my eyes This old clay's gonna give way to glory And like an eagle I'll take to the sky In a world filled with doubts and confusion It's so hard when you don't understand But I'll stand on a solid foundation And I'll hold to an unchanging hand And the sun's coming up in the morning Every tear will be gone from my eyes This old clay's gonna give way to glory And like an eagle I'll take to the skies And the sun's coming up in the morning Every tear will be gone from my eyes This old clay's gonna give way to glory Please take your Bibles this morning for our scripture reading, if you would, please. John 14, please. John chapter 14. For our scripture reading today, we're going to read verses 27 through 31 of John chapter 14. We'll read 27 together, I'll read 28 together on 29, alternating till we end together of reading verse 31 of John 14. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture, all of us standing please to read God's word. Let's begin together on verse 27 of John 14. Ready? Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away, and come again unto you. If ye loved me, ye would rejoice, because I said, I go unto my Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it is come to pass, ye might believe. Hereafter I will not talk much with you. For the prince of this world cometh, and hath nothing in me. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture here this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the good music today. We've enjoyed singing praises to you. Lord, we've enjoyed... Uh, the choir number, we've enjoyed listening to Sweet Hour of Prayer. Uh, It's good to be in church today. Thank you for each one that's made their way here, and Lord, we're asking you now to continue to make our hearts ready to receive the truth from your word. Lord, we trust you'll bless the special to that end today, and I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. More love to Thee, O Christ, more love to
Now, Father, we bow before you in prayer as we come to the preaching of your word. I want to thank you again this morning for the Bible. Lord, uh, our prayer would be what Nikki just sang about, that we would leave the building in a few moments and be able to say, I have more love for Christ now than when I came in. And so, Father, we pray that Christ will be lifted up and that you'll draw all of us closer to him because we were here in church this morning. Lord, I know that on a holiday weekend like this, there's many, many things that could capture our minds and cause our thoughts to be elsewhere. And I pray that you would help each one of us to focus this morning on the truth you have for us here in the words of Jesus in John 14. That none of us would miss what the Holy Spirit of God would want to say to us this morning. So, Lord, go up and down these aisles and in and out of the rows and minister to each individual this morning, please. And give us all ears to hear what the Spirit would say to its church today. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. I apologize for my voice today. It's uh, just allergies, I reckon. And um, I hope it won't be too bothersome for you to listen this morning. John 14, if your Bible's open there, is a tremendous, tremendous chapter. You have to understand this is the words that are spoken in John 14 are spoken just hours before the greatest event in the history of the world that takes place. And that is Jesus Christ, the sinless Son of God, dying on the cross for sinful man. And laying down His life for the sheep, as He would put it. And he, he took our place on the cross and paid for our sin debt and suffered our hell for us so that, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. We get eternal life as a gift because of the price Jesus pays. So He's talking now to His precious friends, His apostles, His followers. They're very confused. They're very fearful. As you'll as we've seen some on Wednesday nights, and you'll see as you read through the Gospels, most of the disciples never ever really believed that suffering and death would be part of the plan. Uh, They thought Jesus was here to set up a kingdom, and uh, they were going to be a part of it. And uh, so when he talks about this, 
they're very discouraged and they're in need of some encouragement as he tells them he's going away. I'm not going to be with you anymore. And so he tells them in the first few verses, he's preparing a place for them. And he tells them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He goes on to tell them later in the chapter uh, that the works I do, you're going to do greater works than I did. He tells them, I'm going to give you another comforter, uh, one just like me, and the Holy Spirit of God's going to come. And He's going to empower you to do the work. Verse 27 that we read a few minutes ago, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth. So He says, I'm promising you peace, but I want us to look this morning <coughs> excuse me, on a statement Jesus makes in verses 30 and 31. He said, Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the Father. I want to focus on those two statements that Jesus made. That the prince of the world cometh and hath nothing in me, and that the world may know that I love the Father. The first statement is, the prince of this world... <clears throat> hath nothing in me. Jesus says, I'm going to the cross. I will there be the sacrifice for sin <coughs> because <coughs> it's the will of my Father. And it has nothing to do with the devil. It has nothing to do with Satan. The devil is the prince of the world. But Christ's death on the cross was not a loss. It was a victory. Him dying for us was not any kind of a victory for Satan. In fact, it was a loss for Satan. Oh, Christ, the Bible says Satan would bruise his heel, but he said Christ would crush his head. All right? And I'd rather have a bruised heel than a crushed head. Amen? And, uh, and he defeated him. He triumphed over him in it, as the Bible tells us. And I want to, what a tremendous statement Jesus made. Did you, did you catch that? The prince of this world cometh and hath what? Nothing in me. Nothing of the devil in Jesus Christ. No deceit. No lying. No lust. No anger. No gossip. No stealing. No coveting. No pride. No jealousy. No envying. No hypocrisy, no strife, no backbiting, no accusing, no hatred, no arrogance, no haughty spirit, no evil eye, nothing. The devil has nothing in me, Jesus said. Now, I would like to say that about myself, but I can't. But I want to. You see, Satan was once my father before I came to know Christ. But when I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior <coughs> and I begin to follow Him, I find that I have less and less in common with the devil. Amen? You're coming down the aisle now. Oh. I, I have cough drops. I, don't, I have cough drops. I do. But I don't know if I can preach with it. It may go flying out on hitting somebody, you know. Thank you, Brother Ron. <clears throat> Anybody who brings me candy is my friend. And um, so Jesus is saying that he, Satan has nothing in him, and I'd like to be able to say he has nothing in me. You and I ought to have it as our goal that we could say the devil has nothing in me. But you understand as long as I hey, listen, I, I I can't I can't put a bottle of alcohol to my lips and say the devil has nothing in me. I cannot put a cigarette to my lips and say the devil has nothing in me. I can't put a pinch of tobacco between my 
uh, cheek and gum and say the devil has nothing in me. I cannot watch the PG-13 and R-rated movies and say the devil has nothing in me. I cannot watch primetime television and say the devil has nothing in me. I can't go to pornographic websites and say the devil has nothing in me. I can't lay in bed when I ought to get up and read my Bible and pray and say the devil has nothing in me. I cannot criticize other believers and say the devil has nothing in me. I cannot be critical and and harsh and unkind to my spouse and my children and say the devil has nothing in me. I cannot sit in church and play games on my cell phone and say the devil has nothing in me. We become far too comfortable in our Christianity by allowing the devil to have a place in our life. That we allow him to have something in us. And we allow Satan to have something in us, a foothold in us, it keeps us from ever making the second statement Jesus makes. He said, the devil has nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the Father. If you never get past the first statement, you'll never be able to say the second one. You will never be able to have the world know that you love God until you get to the point where you say, I want the devil to have nothing in me. Amen, Pastor. That's good preaching. If I have to do the preaching and the amen in both, we'll be a longer service. So I'll try to do the preaching and you do the amen in, all right? Number two, the statement is that the world may know that I love the Father. Jesus, interesting, isn't it? That He said, I want everybody to know that I love God. I want everyone to know that I love the Father. And He did that by obeying the Father. Look at John 14 and verse 15. Jesus said to His disciples, If you love Me, what will they do? Keep My commandments. Look at verse 21. He that hath My commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth Me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Look at verse 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Look at verse 24. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. And the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. You understand? Uh, Jesus says if we love the Father, it will be shown by our willingness and our desire to keep His commandments, to keep His word, to live and conduct our lives as He says to live and conduct our lives. That's how we'll show God that we love Him being obedient. And Christ was obedient to the Father, even obedient unto death, the death on the cross. Showing Him that He loved the Father. Now the question today is this. Does the world know that you love God? Does the world know that you love God? You say, well, how, how will they know? Well, I'm glad you asked me that question. How will they know? Number one, they're going to know by you not just believing in Christ, but following Him. Not just believing in Christ, but following Him. Uh, Go with me to Matthew chapter 7, would you please? Matthew chapter 7. Notice what the Bible says here, Jesus speaking in verse number 21 of Matthew 7, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that, what's the word? Doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. For many will, what's the word? Say to me in that day, 
Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So when I ask you, uh, if, you're, if you really love God, do you tell me about a time you walked an aisle? Do you tell me about when you prayed a prayer? Do you tell me that you know books of the Bible? Or you can quote so many Bible verses. Or maybe you have an outline of a fish on the back of your car. Or a bumper sticker that says, Honk if you love Jesus. Is, what is your relationship with Jesus Christ? Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? There's a fellow several years ago who wrote a book uh, called uh, Not a Fan. And he makes a differentiation in that book about whether you're a follower of Christ or whether you're a fan of Jesus Christ. You know, um, tonight the Cleveland Cavaliers will play a seventh game, a deciding game uh, in the NBA playoffs against the Boston Celtics. And I'm a Cavaliers basketball fan and pull for the Cavaliers. And uh, it's, it, the Suns, as the, as the quartet sang this morning, the sun's coming up in the morning, whether they win or not, okay? And uh, that's all right. But I'm a, I'm a fan of, uh, I follow LeBron James, and uh, some of you know who that is. And uh, if you're a basketball fan, you follow him and uh, averaging over 30-some points a game in the playoffs, almost a, a triple-double, which means he has uh, at least double figures in points, assists, and rebounds almost every game. And so you can, you can follow that, but you know what? It means, it means I'm a fan. I, I, I don't I, I watch them play. I don't I don't participate. I don't I, I cheer and I'll I'll clap and I'll yell at the TV. But I'm never in the game. You understand? I never break a sweat. I never make a sacrifice. Nothing's required of me to just be a fan. Nothing at all. Jesus is not interested in having fans. He's interested in having followers. So many, it seems that so many today are willing to be and desiring to be fans of Jesus Christ, but not followers of Jesus Christ. I'll come and we'll fill the arena for Sunday morning for an hour, and and we'll clap and we'll cheer and we'll we'll get excited. Then I'll go home and do what I want. Don't expect anything out of me until next Sunday morning. They're not interested in being followers of Jesus Christ. But Jesus, when you go through the Gospels, you find out that He was never interested in the size of the crowd. Jesus was always interested in the surrender of His followers. He's always concerned about whether you're following. Are you just believing? Or are you following? Are you just believing? Or are you following? Not everyone that says, not everybody who says they're going to heaven is going. It's an amazing verse. So I show others, I can show the world I love Christ by not just believing in Him, but following Him. Secondly, we show the world that we love God by not just knowing about Jesus, but knowing Jesus. There's a difference. As you, as you read the Bible, and we talked about this at our RU class on Friday night, as you read the Bible, just reading the Bible alone will not give you a relationship with Jesus Christ. Because what reading the Bible alone does is give you information about God. It's when you begin to study God's Word and and you begin to understand what the verses mean. You mean you dissect and define them. You understand what they're saying. They're not just words on a page. And then you memorize those words so that you can meditate on those words that you begin to have a relationship with God. And you begin to not just know about God and store up information about God. 
but you don't know God. You don't have a relationship with Him. There are people who can, who can rattle off all kinds of facts about the Bible and can quote verses to me from the Bible and then go out and, and smoke crack cocaine or go out and smoke marijuana. I said, where's, where's the disconnect here? Because it's just information in their head it's not a relationship they have in their heart with the Lord Jesus. There's a difference between knowing about somebody. I can rattle off all kinds of, of information about LeBron James, but I don't know him. I just know about him. There's people you can rattle off information about because you know some things about them, but that doesn't mean you know them. Don't confuse knowledge with intimacy. Do you know Him? Look at uh, Luke chapter 7. Would you turn there with me please? Luke chapter 7. <clears throat> that the world may know that I love the Father. Luke chapter 7. Verse number 36, if you would please. The Bible says in one of the Pharisees, desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, bought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and then wiped them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisees, which had bidden him, saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say to thee. And he saith, Master, say on. For there was a certain creditor which had two debtors, the one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me therefore, which of them will love him most? And Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave the most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I am into thine house, and thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but the woman, this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. You ever been where that woman was? <coughs> you ever been broken and poured out weeping at Jesus' feet knowing that He died for your sins that He took your place on the cross other, hey, the other people there they didn't understand what she was doing they didn't get it they were critical of her and critical of Jesus because they knew about Jesus but she knew Jesus. And those who only know about Jesus will never understand those who know Jesus. They'll always look at you and think you're a little bit off. Something's wrong with you. But they'll know that you love God because you don't just know about Jesus, you know Jesus. You don't just believe in Jesus, you follow Jesus. Number three, they'll know you love God because <coughs> you don't just love Him as one of the many, but you love Him as the one and only. You don't just love Him as one of the many, but you love Him as one, the one and only. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. How many ways are there to heaven? One. Jesus' way. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. 
There's only one way to get there, that's Jesus Christ. You say, that's pretty narrow. That's just as narrow as the Bible's narrow. There's not the Baptist way, there's not a Catholic way, there's not a Lutheran way, there's not an Episcopalian way, there's just the Bible way. You have to believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior. One way. Now you're in Luke <coughs> 7. Turn with me to Luke 14, would you please? <coughs> Luke 14, please. Look down at verse number 25 with me, will you please? And there went great multitudes with him. And he turned and said unto them. Now, does he have a crowd? Yeah, in fact, great multitudes. Okay? Doesn't say how many that is, but that's a crowd. You know what that is? That's a lot of fans. What does Jesus do? If any man come to me, verse 26, <coughs> and hate not father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whomsoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. I mean, that's, that's not real seeker sensitive of Jesus to talk that way, is it? I mean, doesn't he want all these fans? No, he wants followers. He's interested in surrendered followers, not just fans who want to follow him. And what he's saying here, obviously, he's not saying, and he's not advocating that you hate your family. But he is saying that your passionate love for Jesus Christ ought to be so passionate and so real, and, 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 and it ought to be so great that your, your relationship with your family would look like hate. What he's saying is, he's not sharing us with anyone. And we're not to share Him with anyone. Alright? Let's say that it's Monday night and I go out to take my wife and we go into Red Lobster for dinner. That's my wife's favorite restaurant. My favorite restaurant is whatever restaurant I'm in at the time. <laughs> but that's her favorite. We walk in and Bob Wallace is there. And Bob Wallace is there with this beautiful woman. It's not Kay. Oh! And that's what Bob says when he sees us. And I say, Bob Wallace! Hey! And I go over right to his table and shake his hand and say, who is this? Oh, this so-and-so. But he said, now, Pastor, I know what you're thinking. He says, don't worry. Kay knows all about it. And, and she, she's okay because she knows that I still love her the most. Well, we sit down, we have our meal, and we're talking about it. And my wife does that. You know, I think we ought to tell Kay. <laughs> yeah. So we talk to Kay Wallace and tell her, and she's ready. Bob comes home, and he opens the door. <clears throat> and Kay says, Hello there, Snookums. <laughs> or whatever her pet name is for him. And how was, she says, how was your date tonight? Huh. And Bob says, well, it went okay. And then Kay comes over to him and just gives him a big kiss and a big hug and said, it's okay. As long as I know that you love me too. Now, is that going to happen? No, not going to happen, is it? No. It's not going to take place. That would never happen. By the way, neither, neither Kay would not do that, and neither would Bob. Okay, just so you know. He married her, and she's to be the only one. And when you follow Jesus Christ, He's to be the only one. He's to be the one that you're so passionate about following, so passionate about being with, so dedicated to Him, that, that it seems like you hate everybody else. That's what Jesus is saying. <clears throat> is 
See, we think that as long as I have Jesus on the list, I'm okay. But Jesus says, I have to be first on the list. I have to be at the top of the list. We're to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul. He's got to be number one. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. <clears throat> and all these things will be added unto you. People know I love God by not just believing in Him, but following Him. By not just knowing about Him, but knowing Him. By not just loving Him as one of many, but loving Him supremely and only. And number four, by denying myself and surrendering to Christ. By denying myself and surrendering to Christ. Look at Luke 14 again, where we were. <clears throat> Pick it up now with verse 27 where Jesus said, Whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Then he gives some illustrations. Which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and count the cost, whether you have sufficient to finish it? Lest haply after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand? Or else while the other is a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath cannot be my disciple. You know what Jesus is telling us here? He doesn't negotiate deals. I know we have someone in the White House who thinks he's the greatest deal maker in the world. He'll make great deals. Nobody makes a deal with Jesus Christ. You don't negotiate deals. Well, I'll, I'll follow you, Jesus, but I'm not getting rid of my possessions. He said, you can't be my disciple. Well, I'll follow, I'll follow you, Jesus, but you know, I'm not going to wait till I'm married to be intimate with somebody else. He said, you can't be my disciple. Well, I'm going to follow you, Jesus, but man, I'm not giving 10% of my money. You're crazy. You can't be my disciple. Well, I'll follow you, Jesus, but nobody's telling me what I can wear and what I can't wear. You can't be my disciple. Well, I'm going to follow you, Jesus, but... And, and listen, does that happen? Yeah, that happens. 65% of 18 to 24-year-olds who have said they've made a, quote, commitment to Jesus Christ. And by the way, I don't like that term. Okay. Again, it all has the aspect that we're doing something for salvation. We're, we don't, it's our commitment to Jesus. My salvation is me receiving His gift of eternal life. I was a poor, I'm a beggar. I'm, I'm, a, I'm begging for mercy. I have nothing to commit to Him. But of those 65% who would say that if you ask, is Jesus your Savior? Yes. Those 65%, 25% of them say that having sexual relationships outside of marriage is okay. 15% of them say getting drunk is not wrong. You see, what they're saying is, and we have a generation now that's coming up that's saying, yeah, I'm going to follow you, Jesus, but on my terms. Yeah, I want to follow you, but man, don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me where to go. Don't tell me what I can do, what I can't do. Don't tell me what I can wear, what I can't wear. Don't tell me what I listen to and not listen to. I'm not listening to that, Lord. I mean, I, I, want to, I don't want to go to hell and burn. I get that. But I don't want you running my life. And Jesus said, you're not my disciple. 
I didn't say it. Jesus did. I'm just, just, just being the messenger. That all the world may know that I love the Father. I'll follow you, Lord, but I'm not witnessing anybody. I'm not going to tell anybody how to go to heaven. I'll follow you, Lord. I'm going to be a follower, but not on Sunday night and Wednesday night. Does your life reflect that you love God? Belief that doesn't show in your life is a delusion. Belief that doesn't show up in your life is a delusion. Jesus, notice in verse 27 of Luke 14, He said, You bear as whosoever... Whosoever doth not bear his cross, and notice this phrase, come after me. That's a, that's a pursuit. When I was 18 years of age, I was getting ready to graduate high school. I was sitting in church at Camp Baptist Temple beside my friend Rod Stuchel. And the choir came out to sing, and I pointed to a girl in the choir, and I told him, I'm going to date that girl right there. It was my wife. And, and Rod laughed at me. <laughs> sure. He said, you watch and see. And made the arrangements and at a camp we were at, a Camp Chaff, and, and made the arrangements to have a date with her before she left for college. She went to college 12 hours away down in South Carolina. I had a, I had a the year was 1977, I had a 1969 Volkswagen Bug. There were times in the wintertime driving to work that I would scrape the inside of the windshield as much as I had to do the outside. If you ever had one, the defrosters were non-existent almost. Sometimes driving with my head out the window so I could see. I drove that Bug 12 hours down to South Carolina. I, I sat, I, I drove 12 hours, got up at 4 o'clock in the morning, drove 12 hours, and by the way, it was funny, I pulled into the parking lot of Bob Jones University, pulled in front of the administration building, Brother Moreland, and the VW bug died right there. And I, and I should tell you, it was, a, it was two different color greens. You know what I mean? It just... Not the kind of car that you want sitting in the front of Bob Jones University, you know, but there it was. It was dead. And then we had a, they had an artist series that night. I, I, I never heard of an artist series before. I knew what the World Series was, <laughs> but I didn't know what an artist series was. We came, and then we were in the fifth row, this huge amphitheater. The fifth row, and they start singing. And they're singing opera. And they're not even singing English. They're singing German. I've been up since four in the morning and I'm sitting listening to people sing opera in German. Why did I do all that? Because I was coming after somebody. It was pretty obvious to everybody I was pursuing someone. It wasn't hidden. Is it obvious to other people that you are pursuing God? That you are pursuing Jesus Christ? Is it obvious to others that that's your passion? That that's your pursuit? Is it obvious to everybody that you're following Jesus Christ? That you are coming after Him? An elderly missionary was returning from the foreign field to the U.S. He was going to live out the latter years of his life with his daughter who lived in the Midwest. 
he, he arrived in California and was going to take a bus trip to where his daughter lived, cross country. The first stop where he had to stop and have a layover was Las Vegas. He'd never been there before. He checked into a hotel and took a walk down the famous strip in Las Vegas. Though it was midnight, it looked like the middle of the day with all the bright lights. He said he heard the music and saw the lights and uh, motels and even stopped at a car show that was going on and saw the latest new automobiles. He saw the games of the casinos. He heard the money coming out of the slot machines. He saw the marquees, uh, marquees advertising all the shows. Eventually, he went back to his room in one of the high-rise motels there where he was staying. He walked in the room and he didn't turn on the light. He went over to his window and he pulled back the curtains and he looked out on that strip. And in the quietness of the room, looking down at the Las Vegas strip, he said, God, I thank you that I haven't seen anything tonight that I want more than I want you. Not just believing, but following. Not just knowing about Jesus, but knowing Jesus. Not just loving Him as one of many, but loving Him as the one and only. By denying yourself and surrendering to Jesus Christ. It was Charles Spurgeon who said, I want to so live my life that when I look up to heaven and say, I love you, God. That God can lean over the banister of heaven and say, I know it, Charles. I know it. That all the world may know that I love the Father. Let's pray together. Shall we, Father, take the truth this morning? And I pray, Lord, these, these powerful statements that you made would find a lodging place in our hearts. I pray, first of all, God, that we would make the decision this morning that the prince of this world hath nothing in me. That we would look at our lives and see the places where we've given place to the devil and we're, we're, we're allowing him to stay. And that hinders us from ever saying that the world may know that I love God. I pray that we would love you. You told the church at Corinth, if any man love God, the same is known of him. And I pray that people would see us this world would look at us and, and say, they love God. They're a follower of Jesus Christ. I pray you've spoken to hearts this morning, God. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'll finish praying in just a moment. I know we don't have any visitors this morning. <clears throat> but you know it doesn't mean that there might not be people who are not saved here this morning. When I talk about you being saved and knowing Jesus Christ, are you going back to a time you said a prayer or back to a time when you walked an aisle? Or can you tell me about your relationship with Jesus Christ right now? That you know Him. Because not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. I wonder how many folks here this morning could say, Pastor, I, I know Jesus Christ is my Savior. I know that if I died, I'd go to heaven, and my only plea is what Jesus has done for me. I am, as far as I know my heart, I'm trusting Jesus alone. 